Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis, one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. Today we're continuing our pharmacology lectures and we're talking about the autocoids and the autocoid antagonists. Now if you've seen some of my previous lectures, you've noticed that I do something stupid before each one. Something funny, something that doesn't make sense. But today I've got nothing. Autocoids. I couldn't figure out anything funny with autocoids. Something about transformers, maybe something about cars, I don't know. But I couldn't come up with anything, so today we're playing it straight. Not a single joke throughout this entire time, so don't even crack a smile. So, what's an autocoid? Now, there are some very common things, but we don't usually use the word autocoid very often, even in medicine. So, they're biological factors which act like local hormones, but they're not like traditional hormones. They have a real brief duration, they act near the site of uh, their synthesis, and are not blood-borne. Now, what's important to know about them is that they act on the tissues which synthesize them. So if you think of, of a different example, say the pancreas. So the pancreas will produce insulin and then secrete that insulin into the circulation and then that insulin will affect other organs throughout the body. Now the autocoids are different. So many different tissues can produce the same autocoid. Now this is unlike what we just talked about with our uh, pancreas situation because uh, most circulating hormones are synthesized and secreted from a single gland. So these autocoids can be produced in a lot of different areas. Now also important which I've already mentioned briefly is that they stay where, where they're synthesized. So they're acting on that organ or in that tissue uh, where they're secreted because they're very quickly inactivated so they don't make it into the circulation and affect other areas of the body. Now let's think about what the word autocoid means. So it comes from the Greek. Autos is the first part and that means self and then the akos uh, means relief or remedy or sometimes uh, translated into drug. So that sort of goes along with what we've been talking about with the definition here, that it's sort of a self-remedy. So if a tissue is producing its own little mini hormone and it's uh, having its effect being felt in that little area. So those are how the autocoids are different from sort of our traditional hormones. Um, so what are the important autocoids? So they include prostaglandins, uh, and there's a ton of those, histamine, and serotonin. So there are some other ones, but these are the most important ones, the ones that we uh, either use as medications or we have other medications that try to inhibit the process of both prostaglandins, uh, histamine, and serotonin. So let's first move on to the prostaglandins. Now there's a ton of prostaglandins. We're not going to go through each individual prostaglandin. That would take forever. But we will talk about in general terms the action of the prostaglandins. So what are they? Well, they're fatty acids and uh, fatty acid derivatives, and they have a wide range of actions in the body. In fact, different prostaglandins can have opposing actions. So one type of prostaglandin might cause one thing, and a different prostaglandin will affect it in the complete opposite way. Now, they're synthesized in many different tissues, so there's not a prostaglandin gland that's producing all of our prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are produced in many, many different tissues, and again, they act uh, uh, only locally in that area. So let's talk about some of the general actions of the prostaglandins, just so you have an idea of the medications that we're going to use, what they're going to be doing to the body. So first and foremost that you'll see with prostaglandins is that they affect smooth muscle. So some uh, prostaglandins are potent vasoconstrictors, so smooth muscle in the vasculature are vasoconstrictors, but still we have other prostaglandins that act as vasodilators. In the gastrointestinal tract, uh, most of the prostaglandins will activate GI smooth muscle again. We'll keep coming back to the smooth muscle. Um, and a lot of times, administration of certain prostaglandins will result in uh, colicky cramps. So that's one of the major side effects of these medications is that people have stomach upset because you're, you're squeezing that GI smooth muscle. So how does it affect our airways? Well, uh, respiratory smooth muscle uh, can be relaxed, but again, it can also be contracted uh, by certain prostaglandins. And then platelets, and this is very, very important. They play a critical role in the activation or inhibition of platelet aggregation. So if you watch our lecture on blood drugs, uh, you'll see how aspirin, which is a COX-1 inhibitor, plays a very important role in inhibiting the prostaglandins, and, and this ultimately will, will result in anticoagulation. So uh, half the world, practically, uh, is on aspirin, so that is a prostaglandin-mediated uh, mechanism of action. So very, very important. There's also effects of prostaglandins in the kidney. Uh, 
It helps maintain proper blood flow to the kidney and then uh, subsequently will affect the systemic blood pressure. Uh, reproductive, uterine muscle is contracted by prostaglandin F2 alpha. So very, very important. We'll talk about a medication here in just a minute that that's uh, its primary action. And then in the CNS, so it can act on thermoregulatory center of the hypothalamus to produce fever. So when we get sick, it's prostaglandins that are uh, at least part of the way in influencing our body to produce a fever. And then it also sensitizes uh, spinal neurons to pain. In the eye, it's also very important to know that prostaglandins will decrease intraocular pressure, and that comes into play with some of the medications we try to use. So let's talk about a specific prostaglandin uh, that we use, misoprostol. Very commonly used medication for a lot of different reasons. It's a synthetic analog of prostaglandin E1, and its primary use is in the GI tract. So this is for ulcer prevention. So um, this prostaglandin E1 will stimulate mucus and bicarbonate secretion and enhance mucosal uh, blood flow. So it binds to these prostaglandin receptors on parietal cells and decreases uh, cyclic AMP production. So what did the parietal cells do? Well, the parietal cells are the primary cells that are secreting gastric acid. So these prostaglandins come in and help decrease that overall uh, gastric acid uh, production. So for its overall clinical use, it's a bit limited still. Now, we will potentially use this to prevent NSAID-induced peptic ulcers. So if someone is uh, having to consistently take NSAIDs, then you can use your misoprostol to help prevent that. Now, the big bummer with misoprostol is that you have to take it three to four times per day, which is hard even for your uh, most compliant of patients. It's hard to get anything in the body three to four times a day. And overall, it's not used as often as it was maybe in the past because of this frequency of dosing and because of its side effects. Now, mostly it's been replaced by the proton pump inhibitors or the PPIs and the H2 blockers, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And some of the major uh, side effects uh, tend to be GI as well. Remember how we talked about how abdominal cramping uh, can be a big deal uh, with the prostaglandins. Another clinical use is an abortifacient. So, uh, most of the time you're going to use this in combination with uh, mifepristone, or also referred to as RU486, and this is an antiprogestant. So after you use that, usually at least 24 hours later, you can use the uh, misoprostol, which will cause uterine contractions. Remember how we talked about one of the uh, effects of prostaglandins on the body is that it can cause uterine contractions. So this will uh, subsequently cause an expulsion of the embryo. Sort of similarly, labor induction. So uh, misoprostol has been used for many years for labor induction. It can cause uterine contractions uh, and effacement. So effacement is sort of the thinning or sometimes referred to as the ripening of the cervix. Now there is some controversy. Some people don't like using this because uh, there have been some studies that have shown an increased incidence of uterine rupture, which is obviously a horrible thing, and then also uterine hyperstimulation. So you got to be really careful if you see any problems, um, if you're monitoring the baby, if you see any weird uterine contraction patterns and you want to get um, that misoprostol out of the patient. Adverse effects, we talked about this briefly before, diarrhea, abdominal cramping in 10 to 20 percent. So very, very common to get some significant cramping. Again, it's going to stimulate uterine contractions, and if you're trying to induce labor, then that's great. Uh, if it's someone who's pregnant but not at term, you probably don't want to give this medication because you're going to cause preterm labor, so that's not a good thing. And then you probably don't want to use this in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and that makes sense, or probably irritable bowel syndrome either. If someone has a lot of sensitive stomach issues, you probably don't want to give them a whole lot of muscle cramps and uh, contractions in their GI smooth muscle. Next, we're going to move on briefly to talk about prostaglandin drugs used in glaucoma. Uh, remember how we talked about how the prostaglandin actions in the eye decrease intraocular pressure. So, sounds great for, for glaucoma, doesn't it? So, latanoprost, uh, bimatoprost, travoprost, and uh, onoprostone are the drops that we use for glaucoma, and these are long-acting prostaglandin F2 alpha derivatives. Now, they're administered by drop into the uh, conjunctival sac once or twice daily. And then, again, they act to decrease intraocular pressure. Now, side effects are, are interesting. You might get questions on this. Irreversible brown pigmentation of the iris and the eyelashes. 
So remember that you have to warn your patients that um, you can get these medications and they can cause um, some, some pigmentation. You can get drying of the eyes and conjunctivitis. Anytime you're putting something in the eye, any type of drop, you can potentially get conjunctivitis. Um, so remember those for your prostaglandins uh, in glaucoma. All right, so now we're going to switch major gears here. We're moving on to histamine. Very, very common talked about uh, entity in the body because we're always trying to fight against it. So we've heard of histamine, but what is it? Well, it's a chemical messenger found in tissues, plants, uh, and sometimes in the venom of some insect stings. Uh, it has effects on multiple organ systems. It leads to increased gastric acid secretion, inflammatory reactions, allergic reactions. It can function as a neurotransmitter in the brain as well. So histamine is an, an amine formed by the decarboxylation of the amino acid histidine by histidine decarboxylase. And this is an enzyme that is expressed in cells throughout the body. Now histamine is produced throughout the body, but some areas have higher concentrations. So, and this will include the GI tract, the lung, and then of course the skin. Now histamine is found in very high concentrations in mast cells. And I'm sure you've heard of mast cells and how they uh, have these granules of histamine built up in them. Now, if histamine is not stored, it is rapidly inactivated by amine uh, oxidase enzymes. So this follows our typical autocoid pattern, that uh, it doesn't get into the circulation in the typical pattern and cause systemic sy symptoms. Histamine is a little bit different, though. We'll talk about that in here in a second. Now, because it's rapidly inactivated, there's little significant effect with normal circulating levels of that histamine. So it then becomes more clinically significant, though, when a stimuli provokes a large amount of histamine release. So this may be from uh, cold, bacterial toxins, insect stings, and probably most commonly, allergic reactions. So histamine will bind to one of four histamine receptors. So, and we refer to these H1, H2, H3, and H4. Now we're gonna concentrate only today on H1 and H2. We don't have a lot of um, significant clinical interactions, at least with medications, when it comes to H3 and H4. So H1 and H2 are very, very common though. So let's talk about these receptors and how they affect the body um, in regards to, to these drugs. So H1 receptors, so when they're activated, we're not blocking yet, uh, you get increased production of nasal and bronchial mucus, so that makes sense. So when we get allergic reactions, we get a lot of snot. Constriction of bronchioles, so this can result in symptoms of asthma and uh, decreased lung capacity. You can get constriction of intestinal smooth muscle, resulting in cramps and diarrhea. And then it can cause itching and pain. H2 receptors, so these uh, H2 receptors are very important in the secretion of gastric acid. So H2 receptors are found on gastric parietal cells. We talked about that a little bit earlier when we were talking about prostaglandins. Now, H1 and H2 together can also affect the body, so they can lower systemic blood pressure by reducing peripheral resistance. Now, this can be dramatic when a patient undergoes maybe a scenario of anaphylaxis. So they get hypotensive. So when you lower that blood pressure, it can cause some significant problems. You can get dilation and increased permeability of the capillaries, resulting in leakage of proteins and fluid into the tissues. So this, in skin, uh, will give you the triple response. So wheel formation, reddening due to local vasodilation, and the flare or kind of that halo that comes around. So now let's talk about how we use drugs to block these histamine receptors. So first we're gonna talk about the H1 antihistamines. Now these are very, very common medications. They're used all the time. Many are, are over the counter and people use them all the time. Now most of the time when people are referring to an antihistamine, so, oh, I took my antihistamine today. They're, all, they're almost always referring to an H1 blocker and not an H2 blocker. So be aware of that. Even though H2 blockers are still antihistamines, most of the time people are referring to the H1 blocker. Now, H1 blockers are divided into first generation and second generation. Obviously, first generation came first and then the second. The first generation medications include diphenhydramine, chlorpheniramine, uh, cyclozine, Dimenhydrinate, doxepin, doxylamine, hydroxazine, meclizine, and promethazine. Though promethazine 
is sort of half an antihistamine and half something else. Um, but they'll still put promethazine in the H1 blockers as well. Second generations include cetirizine, desloratadine, fexofenidine, and regular loratadine. Pharmacokinetics. Now, these medications do not uh, affect histamine itself. It blocks at the actual receptor. So remember, when we're talking about H1, it's H1 receptor that we're blocking. Now, the H1 blockers are rapidly absorbed after oral administration, so these are pretty much all oral. Um, they reach peak blood concentrations within one to two hours, and they are widely distributed throughout the body. The duration of action is at least 24 hours, so these are longer-acting medications. Many of them can be taken just once a day. Now, they are competitive inhibitors at the H1 receptor, and they're not uh, irreversible. They are reversible inhibitors. The first generation H1 blockers have a greater tendency to pass the blood-brain barrier, and thus they cause more sedation than the second generation, which tend not to get into the CNS. And that um, has both positive and negative effects depending on what you want to have happen. So for therapeutic use, we all know we use our H1 blockers for allergic reactions. So often the very first line uh, for allergic rhinitis or urticaria, so when someone comes in with hay fever, uh, we can certainly grab for these medications. Another clinical use, motion sickness. So the first generation H1 blockers can be used for this. So diphenhydramine, promethazine, diminhydrinate, cyclazine, meclazine, and hydroxazine. These all have been used for motion sickness. Uh, sometimes they're combined with scopolamine, which is another medication that we use for uh, motion sickness. And also a sleep aid. So uh, these medications can make you sleepy, especially the first generation blockers. Remember, they get into the CNS. Um, and these medications uh, are often combined for sleep aids that are even over the counter. So things like acetaminophen with diphenhydramine, uh, so Tylenol PM. Uh, so things that have PM next to them, people think they're these amazing uh, sleep aids, uh, but really it's just uh, a H1 blocker that they're throwing in with whatever analgesic medication or whatever else they have going on. Adverse effects. So again, it comes back to first-generation drugs tend to have more uh, side effects because they enter the CNS. Uh, they also in uh, interact with some other receptors as well, including uh, muscarinic cholinergic receptors, alpha adrenergic receptors, uh, and serotonin receptors. So you're always going to get more side effects with the uh, first generation. The first uh, uh, major one is sedation. So because those first generation uh, block the effect of histamine in the CNS, this leads to sedation. You can get some tinnitus or ringing in the ears, sometimes some fatigue and dizziness, uncoordination, blurred vision, and even tremor. And because the second generation, again, do not enter the CNS, you're going to get a lot less sedation, a lot less CNS effects. The uh, H1 blockers uh, can cause some dry mouth. There is some weak anticholinergic effects with the H1 blockers. Dry mouth, dry nasal passages, some blurred vision even. Drug interactions. H1 blockers can potentiate the effects of other medications that depress the CNS. So anything that depresses the CNS, alcohol, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, probably don't want to take these with those medications because you're going to get even further CNS depression. Probably also don't want to take H1 blockers with MAOI, so the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, you don't want to use those because the anticholinergic activity of the H1 blockers will be more pronounced, more severe if an MAOI is on board as well. Overdose, the H1 blockers are relatively safe. Now, and as I said before, a lot of these are over the counter. Now they're not completely benign though. You also have to be very careful uh, with our pediatric patients because uh, if it's coming in a liquid form, you can always overdose a kid by giving them too much liquid. So there are some potential side effects uh, or, or overdose effects. And the signs of overdose can be significant. So CNS effects like hallucinations, excitement, ataxia, uh, even convulsions. So be careful. It doesn't happen that often, but uh, be aware of it. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Why, hello there! I have a quick question for you. If first-generation H1 blockers such as diphenhydramine are so sedating, why aren't they recommended for long-term use as sleep aids? These drugs typically have long half-lives, leading to sedation the following morning decreased alertness, diminished cognitive function, and even delirium. 
Plus, they cause lots of anti-muscarinic side effects, especially in the elderly, including dry mouth, blurred vision, urinary retention, and constipation. Me? Elderly? Around this place, I'm just a whippersnapper. Why, you see Seymour over there? He's 102. But insomnia? Not on your life. You couldn't keep him awake with a whole chorus line full of showgirls singing Won't You Come Home Bill Bailey at the top of their lungs. Now run along. It's time for my medication. Nurse? Nurse! Hi, I'm Dr. Mike McKinnis, and let's go over the answers to quick review number one. So the first question, why don't autocoids exert their effects systemically? Well, autocoids are inactivated very quickly, and therefore they only exert their effects locally. Next, why is it misoprostol used very often for the prevention of peptic ulcers? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, it has to be taken three or four times a day. And number two, it causes GI cramping and diarrhea, so it's not very well tolerated. Next. When activated, H1 and H2 receptors cause dilation and increased permeability of capillaries, which can lead to the triple response of the skin. So what is this triple response? So first you get reddening due to local vasodilation in the capillaries. Then you get flare, you get more extensive hyperemia and extensive reddening. And then you get what's called a wheel formation. So you'll hear about that wheel and flare. Wheels are, are hives, basically, these raised, uh, raised lesions, they can be very itchy, they can spread, they can be coalescing, so wheel and flare is part of that triple response. Next, what anti-muscarinic medication is used often for motion sickness? So we mentioned that the H1 antihistamines, the H1 blockers, can be used for motion sickness because they have anti-muscarinic activity. But the most common motion sickness drug is scopolamine, which is an anti-muscarinic drug all of its own. Next, why do first-generation H1 blockers have more side effects than the second-generation drugs? Well, these drugs can cross the blood-brain barrier, and therefore they can enter the CNS. And there they interact with cholinergic receptors and adrenergic receptors and serotonin receptors. So they have a lot more side effects because of all of this. Next, which histamine receptor is more responsible for gastric acid secretion, and on what cells are these receptors located? So this is not the H1 receptor, this is the H2 histamine receptor that's responsible for gastric acid secretion, and these are found in the gastric parietal cells. Now, H2 receptors are also found in other tissues. They're found in vascular smooth muscle cells, and in neutrophils, and in the heart, and the uterus, and in the CNS, but obviously these cells don't stimulate gastric acid secretion. Next, what are the major side effects of the prostaglandins used in glaucoma? So, you have these, uh, these prostaglandin eye drops, they can cause irreversible brown pigmentation of the iris and the eyelashes. They can cause drying of the eyes, and they can also cause conjunctivitis. And finally, which medications are useful in the treatment of dysmenorrhea, or painful menstruation? Well, these are the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as aspirin or ibuprofen, naproxen, indomethacin. There's tons of these drugs. These NSAIDs inhibit cyclooxygenase, which is the enzyme that synthesizes prostaglandins. Prostaglandins contribute to the painful uterine contractions during menstruation. So if you inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, you reduce these menstrual cramps. That's the end of our quick review number one. Let's go back to Dr. Lewis. All right, so now we're moving on to our other uh, histamine receptor blockers, our H2 receptor antagonists. And these include cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, and nizatidine. Very commonly used medications as well. The H2 receptors uh, are important in the secretion of gastric acid, so we've talked about this before as well. They competitively block histamine from binding to the H2 receptors on parietal cells. Remember our parietal cells again are, are uh, gastric acid secretors. Now it reduces the intracellular cyclic AMP, which ultimately decreases acid secretion. It's good for nocturnal acid suppression, Cimetidine is the least potent, and famotidine is the most potent of these medications. Nizatidine uh, is important because it doesn't undergo first-pass metabolism, whereas the other H2 blockers do have some degree of first-pass metabolism. The duration is about 10 hours. Um, sometimes you can give these once a day, but oftentimes you're giving them twice a day. Clinical use. So they do have some great clinical uses. First, peptic ulcers. So, all H2 blockers promote healing of duodenal and gastric ulcers. 
And uh, unfortunately, mostly they've been replaced by the PPIs, or maybe fortunately because they're better medications. Um, so the proton pump inhibitors are the primary medications that we're using for acid suppression in any type of ulcerative uh, process. Now for ulcers that are due to H. pylori or helicobacter pylori, H2 blockers no longer play any role. So these need to be non-H. pylori positive ulcers that you even consider using the uh, H2 blockers. Now duodenal ulcers take about eight weeks to heal um, and for more about specific ulcers and uh, especially the H. pylori ulcers and how to treat those, we do have a great uh, lecture on a GI drug, so you might want to look at that. H2 blockers can be used in GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, and this is probably where you're going to find this medication most often used. It can be used intermittently for mild GERD, so if a patient just has, oh man, I ate four pizzas last night, I have a little GERD, I don't usually have it, H2 blocker is a great medication to think about in that situation. Most of the time, it's taken twice daily uh, for frequent heartburn, and it's effective uh, in about 50% of patients. And again, for severe or persisting heartburn, our proton pump inhibitors are used a bit more often, especially as they're getting less and less expensive. Prevention of bleeding from stress-related gastritis. So one to 5% of critically ill patients will get an ulcer or upper GI erosion. Uh, so you can give an H2 blocker by a nasoenteric tube or intravenously to help decrease this. Again, our PPIs are probably used a little bit more often for this as well now, but you can still use this. Zollinger uh, Ellison syndrome is a gastrin producing tumor of the pancreas or the small intestine can uh, lead to an accumulation or, or, or over acidification of the uh, stomach and it can lead to ulcers, so you can use your H2 blockers for that. And then for prophylactic indications, so again, for our non-H. pylori ulcers, you can give this once at bedtime to help prevent future ulcers, even though they're not in an ulcerative state right then and there. And then also to prevent the NSAID-induced ulcers. Remember how we use our misoprostol. If someone's having to take NSAIDs on a regular basis, you can give the H2 blockers to help prevent ulcer formation. Adverse effects. These are very safe drugs. Again, these are over-the-counter in a lot of cases. It does cross the blood-brain barrier and the placenta and excreted in milk, but it is a category B, so you can use these medications in pregnancy. It's generally considered safe. Less than 3% of the population who takes these medications will get diarrhea, some headache, some fatigue, myalgias, constipation. Very rarely, but important, you need to realize that you can get some blood dyscrasias and even some bradycardia. So if you have something really weird going on, be aware that H2 blockers can have some more serious effects. Great test question is about cimetidine. So cimetidine, uh, which is different than the other H2 blockers, has this anti-androgen effect. And this can lead to gynecomastia in men, sometimes, rarely though, galactorrhea, and then reduce a sperm count. So remember that cimetidine is the only one that has this anti-androgen effect and can cause these symptoms. Drug interactions. Uh, cimetidine primarily has the biggest uh, interaction. It interferes with cytochrome P450, so be aware of that in your other drugs. And that's going to do it for our H2 blockers. Next, we're going to move on to migraine medications. So first, let's talk a little bit about migraine headaches themselves. Now, you have either hopefully haven't experienced migraine headaches yourself, but you're going to run into a lot of patients with a lot of migraine headaches. It can cause a lot of uh, debilitation and uh, money is lost to uh, lost productivity. So it is a very big deal. So a migraine headache is a debilitating condition. It's characterized by moderate to severe headaches and nausea. It's about three times more common in women than in men. And the typical migraine is unilateral. So you'll see it on one side of your head and it's a pulsating scenario. So a pulsating in nature and it lasts anywhere from a few hours to a few days. I have had patients who have had these for, for upwards of a week. Most of the time you see this in the 24 hour range, but um, hopefully patients have it shorter than that. Symptoms include nausea, vomiting, Photophobia, so uh, increased sensitivity to light. Phonophobia, which is an increased sensitivity to sound. Uh, and now the symptoms are generally aggravated by uh, just regular routine activity. So when someone has a migraine, they're incapacitated. You know, one, one thing that I ask my patients uh, is, when you get this headache, do you, can you keep working? Can you keep doing what you're doing? And they say, no, I have to go into a dark room or I have to put a washcloth over my eyes and hopefully I just lay there until it goes away or until I fall asleep or, or something else happens. So that's a good question for your migraine patients. If they're like, yeah, you know, it doesn't really bother me that much. I can keep working. 
It doesn't absolutely mean it's not a migraine, but most severe migraines, people are down and out. They're in that, that dark room and they're not able to do much else. Now, approximately one third of people who suffer from migraine headaches uh, perceive an aura. So this is sort of an unusual visual or olfactory or, or a smell and sometimes a sensory experience. And these are sort of signs uh, that a migraine will soon occur. So some people will see um, kind of halos around people or they'll get a funny taste in their mouth. Some people say, oh, I, I taste metal or something weird going on. Then their headache comes on a, a few minutes later. Now, the exact cause of migraines has been in debate for quite some time. It's been a tricky deal. There's probably a lot of factors that contribute to migraines. Now, originally we thought that the migraine headache was caused by the dilation of blood vessels in the brain, while the aura resulted from vasoconstriction. Now, we haven't abandoned this theory, but it looks like there's a lot more to it. This isn't the whole story, uh, so to speak, when it comes to what's causing migraines. There's a theory out there called the cortical spreading depression theory, and this is where you have sort of this self-propagating wave of neuronal and glial depolarization that spreads across the cerebral cortex. Now, this theory hopes to explain the cause of the aura uh, and some of the other mechanisms that uh, are thought to be uh, the cause of the pain of the migraine headaches or why it's only on one side of the brain and so forth. Now, we also know that migraines involve the trigeminal nerve distribution uh, to the intracranial arteries. So, these vasodilating peptides are released from these nerves uh, and this leads to intracranial artery vasodilation and we think that's part of the scenario as well which is initiating these migraine headaches. Now we could spend all day on this subject. We can talk about migraines. You can read article after article and there's a lot of conflicting data on what's causing the migraine headaches. But I think this at least gives you a baseline of, of why some of these medications are going to work um, and why they're autocoids. So the drugs that we're going to use are pretty helpful. But realize that for most migraines, at least in the beginning, clinicians start with analgesics. So if you have a patient who comes in, you're pretty sure they're having migraines, they're having their unilateral pain, it's throbbing, it's lasting several hours, photophobia, phonophobia, the whole spiel, they have to go lay down. The first thing we grab for are NSAIDs. So we're using things like ibuprofen, we're using naproxen um, for our sort of beginning therapy for these patients. Now, Antiemetics are sometimes used. Patients will have a lot of nausea and vomiting with severe migraines, so you can certainly grab for those antiemetics. Opioids are sometimes used. Still, we consider this hopefully a last line uh, effort. Opioids are never great uh, for controlling long term migraine use. I've certainly had to use them in someone who's just dying. They're in front of me and they're in tears and they're like, I need immediate relief. Sure, opioids are okay. Um, but you're going to run into addiction problems. You're going to get into the, pho the phenomena of rebound headache. If you have someone who's constantly taking opioids for headaches or for other reasons, as soon as their body starts having any type of withdrawal, it can be a trigger for their migraines. I've had scenarios where people have had so rapid of, of a recurrence of their migraines, we thought it was just from, from that rebound phenomena of, of being on opioids. We just took them off of all medications, hospitalized them, and then tried to almost detox them off of their medications in order to get their migraine headaches under better control. Kind of a miserable, miserable situation, but um, sometimes you have to do that in order to get people well. So what medications do we use when the analgesics aren't working? Well, we generally use the triptans, and that's where we come into our autocoid scenario here. Now, the triptans include sumatriptan, a naratriptan, risatriptan, elatriptan, almotriptan, frovatriptan, and zomatriptan. So the triptans are highly effective. Now they can reduce symptoms or even abort the attack uh, within 30 to 90 minutes in 70 to 80 percent of patients. So we get pretty good results uh, with the triptans. And uh, the triptans are serotonin, 5-HT-1D-1B agonist. So that's why uh, these are considered autocoids because this is a serotonin um, scenario that we're, that we're dealing with. Now the mechanism uh, by which these drugs improve migraines is still a little, a little unclear. Uh, you know how we were talking about how we don't really have an exact clear picture on what causes migraines, but we do know that these medications work. So sometimes we can work backwards. Uh, we may not know exactly what's causing something, but we know it fixes it. So how is it fixing it? And then we work backwards. So um, now we suspect that the triptans activate the serotonin 5-HT1D1B receptors on presynaptic trigeminal nerve endings. Remember how we talked about 
how those trigeminal nerves are shooting out those uh, vasodilating peptides. So we're thinking that these medications will inhibit the release of those vasodilating peptides and therefore you're not getting that vasodilation in this cerebral artery. So that vasoconstriction action of the tryptans may prevent the vasodilation and stretching of the pain uh, endings in those arteries. Now these drugs work with um, a very similar efficacy. So there's usually not, well, we always start with this uh, uh, tryptan before we use any of the other tryptans, but you will find that some people like one more than the other. Um, it's not just a slam dunk that they all work for each, uh, for each uh, patient. Now they can be taken orally uh, for most of these situations, but sumatriptan does have a sub-Q form, which is nice. It works a little bit faster. Zolmatriptan has a nasal spray, which even works a little bit faster as well than the oral. Uh, Zolmatriptan and Rizotriptan have a uh, disintegrating tablet. So when someone, either they can't swallow pills, the disintegrating tablet might work a little bit faster as well. Adverse effects. The main one you need to realize is that uh, you can have some significant elevation in blood pressure and cardiac events uh, have been reported with triptan use. So triptan should not be administered to patients with coronary artery disease. So make sure that when you're screening patients uh, that you look at, well, have you had any heart problems? If not, you're probably okay with these medications. Um, but some people feel weird on these medications as well, so it's not completely benign. Some people feel kind of spaced out. Um, they won't, it's hard to describe. People will have sort of strange sensations when they're on the triptans. They say they just don't feel all together with it. The next medication is dihydroergotamine. Now this medication is used a little bit more historically than currently. Now it's an ergot alkaloid used in the treatment of migraines. And it has uh, a pretty similar mechanism of action to the triptans, but it works on other things as well. It'll work on dopamine and adrenergic receptors as well, which leads to more side effects. Generally, it's given IV. There are some oral forms of some other ergots, but uh, dihydroergotamine generally is used IV. And it's more effective if it's given in the prodrome of the migraine attack. So if someone's having an aura or if they have this uh, sensation that things are starting, uh, potentially you're going to want to use this medication early because the further you get into a migraine, uh, the harder it is to treat. As, as, and this goes along with the triptans as well, which I didn't mention. Both the triptans and dihydroergotamine, if you don't treat them early, there's less likelihood that you're going to have success uh, with these medications. Now, the vasoconstriction is long-lasting. Uh, so remember how our triptans were decreasing those uh, vasodilating peptides. Same scenario here, you're getting vasoconstriction in the cerebral arteries. Um, and you get this cumulative effect with uh, dihydroergotamine. So you have to be very careful that you don't uh, go beyond the maximum dose of this medication because you don't want to end up hypoperfusing your brain uh, because of dihydroergotamine. Adverse effects include uh, nausea. I've only seen this medication used a couple of times. Usually it's with very, very severe migraines. Someone's really in agony. Nothing else has worked. Uh, or they're getting such rapid uh, recurring migraines that, that they've had to be hospitalized. Um, because that's really where you're going to see this. No one's going to be giving themselves IV stuff at home for their migraines. Uh, it's, it's really just sort of a, a last-ditch effort in, in many cases because it's difficult to take and it does have some side effects. And you kind of reach this maximum dose, which can be a big deal. So you're not going to see uh, that medication very often but you're going to see triptans all the time. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Do you suffer from migraine headaches? Did you know that many common foods can trigger migraines? Patients who are prone to migraines should avoid alcohol, chocolate, Caffeine, aged cheeses such as cheddar, mozzarella, parmesan, and Swiss. Foods rich in tyramine, including processed meats, pickles, onions, olives, certain types of beans, raisins, nuts, avocados, canned soups, and red wine, monosodium glutamate, aspartame, nitrates, and nitrites. Stop! Are you trying to kill me? Sorry. I guess I got carried away. All right, let's go through the answers to quick review number two. So the first question, what is unique about the H2 blocker cimetidine? Well, cimetidine has anti-androgenic effects. 
And so it can cause gynecomastia, it can cause galactorrhea, and it can cause a reduced sperm count. The other H2 blockers do not have this effect, so they're used more often. Next, a 45-year-old man presents with a burning pain in the epigastrium. His pain is worse when he has an empty stomach. So there's a clinical clue. Occasionally, he will have pain that radiates to his back. Maybe that's another clue. He has noticed some black stool during bowel movements. What type of ulcer does he probably have? The answer is he has a duodenal ulcer. The clue is he has pain when his stomach is empty. Classically, epigastric pain with eating might indicate a gastric ulcer, although that's not always the case. And there are other things that can cause epigastric pain with eating, like pancreatitis or maybe bowel ischemia. Pain can radiate to the back with peptic ulcer. Again, this is not specific. Now, the presence of melana, or that black tarry stool, could indicate an upper gastrointestinal bleed. The iron in the hemoglobin uh, is oxidized, and it turns black, and, and the stool becomes very black and tarry and really foul-smelling and nasty. So the suspicion is that he has a bleeding a duodenal ulcer, and he needs an urgent endoscopy. Don't just put him on an H2 blocker or some other treatment. You need to get this patient scoped. Next. What test must be performed on any patient diagnosed with peptic ulcer disease? Well, the test is H. pylori testing. Now, there's lots of different ways to do this testing. You can do a serum antibody test. Sometimes you do a urease breath test. The most definitive test is done on a microscopic examination uh, of a tissue sample taken from an endoscopic examination of the ulcer. Now, it's important to know, without appropriate antibiotic treatment, the recurrence rate is 60 to 100 percent per year. So if you have an H. pylori-induced ulcer, if you don't kill off that H. pylori, your ulcer is going to come back in a year. There's a pretty good chance of it. With antibiotic therapy, the recurrence rate drops to less than 15%. So if H. pylori is present, you cannot use H2 blockers. They play no role in the treatment. You have to use uh, proton pump inhibitors, and you have to use specific triple therapy, and that's covered in the lecture on gastrointestinal drugs. Next. What are the usual instructions given to patients regarding oral administration of triptans? So you take one dose orally at the beginning of migraine. The first sign, the first bit of aura, the first inkling of a headache that you think is a migraine, you go ahead and take your dose. Then if the headache persists after one or two hours, you can take a second dose. But you don't want to take any more than two doses in a 24-hour period. Very important instructions to give your patients because they're going to be in a lot of pain. They're going to think, well, one didn't work. Well, I'll take a couple more. Um, six hours later, I'm still not feeling good. Maybe I'll take one more. So they can overdose very easily. So you have to give them specific instructions on, on how to take these drugs. Next, triptans are con contraindicated in which patients? So classically, we say that triptans increase the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. So we don't give them to patients with coronary artery disease or other forms of atherosclerotic disease. Now that said, there have been some very large cohort studies that have failed to demonstrate an association between triptans and cardiovascular events. But still, the standard of care is that we don't give these drugs to patients with coronary disease. And if you do, and the patient subsequently has a big MI, that patient's malpractice attorney is going to have a field day. So consider these drugs contraindicated in patients with coronary disease or other atherosclerotic diseases. Next, what is often combined with oral ergotamine to help facilitate absorption. Well, this is caffeine. And the last one, an overdose of an ergot derivative can lead to what very dangerous adverse reaction? Well, this can cause prolonged vasospasm, which can result in gangrene or bowel infarction. So just like with the triptans, we don't give these ergotamines to patients with coronary disease or any other vascular disease. So that's the end of the quick review. Now it's time for your end of session quiz. So I want you to pause the video, complete the end of session quiz in your study guide, and then restart the video and we'll go through those answers together. All right, let's go through the end of session quiz together. First question, how does misoprostol induce abortion? Misoprostol induces uterine contractions and that can lead to abortion. Next. What is the most common side effect of the first generation H1 receptor antagonist? So the most common side effect is sedation because of all those CNS effects. Next, match the following drug with its adverse effect. So diphenhydramine, it's going to have a lot of anti-muscarinic effects, anti-cholinergic effects, so it can lead to dry mouth. The next one, dihydroergotamine, 
will commonly cause nausea. Sumatriptan may be associated with cardiac events, as we said. And then misoprostol, as we just mentioned, can cause uterine contractions. Next, which generation of H1 blockers can be used for motion sickness? Well, these are the first generation drugs, again, because of their anti-muscarinic effects. Next, classify the following H1 antihistamines as either first generation or second generation. So, cetirizine is second generation, chlorpheniramine is first generation, fexafenidine is second generation, diamond hydronate is first generation, loratadine is second generation, hydroxazine is first generation, and meclizine is first generation. Next, a 50-year-old male comes to your clinic because he's developing breasts. No fun for him. His only medication is cimetidine, which he's been on for six years. He wants to know if this drug could be responsible for this new change. And the answer is yes, because remember, cimetidine has anti-androgenic effect and can cause gynecomastia. But this doesn't occur with other H2 receptor blockers. Next, the primary action of the triptans on the vasculature in the brain is what? Well, this is vasoconstriction. That's why we think they're useful for migraines. Next, why is it so important to limit the weekly amount of ergotamines taken by a patient? Well, again, the ergotamine overdose can lead to prolonged vasospasm, and that can cause gangrene or bowel infarction. Next, determine whether the following actions are due to H1 receptors, H2 receptors, or both. So you've got to know the difference between the two receptors and what they do. So the first one, increased production of nasal and bronchial mucus. This is an H1 receptor effect. Dilation and increased permeability of the capillaries results in leakage of proteins and fluids into the tissues. Occurs from both H1 and H2. Causes itching and pain. This is primarily H1 receptors. Important in secretion of gastric acid is H2 receptors. And lower systemic blood pressure by reducing peripheral resistance is both H1 and H2 receptors. Last question. Which first generation antihistamine is most commonly used to treat vertigo? Well, this is meclizine. The brand name of meclizine is Antivert, anti-vertigo. It can be used to treat a lot of different types of vertigo, such as benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or labyrinthitis or other things. Diamond hydronate and diphenhydramine can also be used, but meclizine is by far the most commonly used drug for any type of vertigo. So that's the end of the intercession quiz, and that's the end of the lecture on autocoids and their antagonists. Good luck studying.